welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where after yesterday's sort of magnum opus on the um, on an incredibly difficult Sudoku puzzle, uh, I thought we'd change tack today. We've had a number of um, requests on the channel to show some different types of puzzles, um, some more puzzle hunt puzzles, or perhaps some more Japanese pencil style puzzles. Um, so just for a change, I thought we might look at one of the classic Japanese puzzles, the Masu puzzle, uh, today. And then I was thinking, okay, well, if we're going to do Masu puzzle, you know, what would be a good example? And I thought what we might do is take a look at last year's US Puzzle Championship, and we'll look at the Masu puzzle from, from this exam. Now, those of you who don't know, US Puzzle Championship happens every year, it normally happens around June, and it's basically a two and a half hour online exam um, where there's a maximum 300 points available and the top few competitors are selected from that uh, to represent the US in the World Puzzle Championship um, and believe it or not and it is hard to believe if you've ever actually looked at these puzzles occasionally somebody uh, Thomas Snyder I know has done this uh, on a number of occasions, finishes the whole thing within two and a half hours. So they average two points a minute. Now, believe me, this, I mean, that is just insane solving ability. Um, we've just flipped through this now. There's a, an awful lot of variety, a heck of a lot of logic problems. This is the Matthew puzzle we're going to take a look at in a minute. Um, you know, and even the stuff that I consider myself to be relatively practiced at, you know, the Sudokus, the Kakurus, you know, they are monstrous varieties. Let's just have a look at this go for whole Sudoku by Adam Woods, 30 point puzzle. So in theory, if you want to finish this test, you need to be getting this puzzle out in 15 minutes. Well, let me tell you, you're doing very well if you can get this out in half an hour, let alone 15 minutes. Um, so maybe we might have a look at that puzzle in, a, in another edition of Cracking the Cryptic. Okay, so how does a Matthew puzzle work? What are the rules? And I've borrowed uh, this from gmpuzzles.com, one of my favorite sites. Uh, and in fact, ironically or not, um, actually a site run by Tom Snyder, who we've been talking about in the context of somebody who actually finishes the US Puzzle Championship on occasion. So let's have a look at this. Rules, draw a single non-intersecting loop that passes through all circled cells. Okay, so it needs to pass through the circled cells. Importantly, it doesn't need to pass through all of the squares in the grid. So there's no requirement for it to visit every square. It simply needs to visit the circled squares. And the loop must go th straight through the cells with white cells, circles. So let's have a look here. You can see two examples. The loop has continued straight through both of these white circles which is important, but it must make a turn in at least one of the cells immediately before or after each white circle. So you can see in this correct solution here, it goes straight through and it continues straight through here, but that means it must turn in this square. It, ca it could not continue along here because that would mean that in both of the cells, either side of the white cell, the loop had continued in a straight line. And it must turn in at least one of the cells uh, on either side of a white circle. And now for black circles, the loop must make a turn in all the black circles. So a turn means you know we need a right angle of the loop. And it must go straight through each of the squares either side of the uh, of the black circle. So now that might seem quite complicated, but actually, as we'll see, and I'm going to look at um, I'm going to look at the puzzle we're going to try and solve in a moment, and and talk about how we might go about some spotting the simple ways to start one of these puzzles, and then we'll talk about how to actually solve fully the example in question. So here we go. Now I need to thank somebody for this, Otto Yanko, um, who uh, has a site which I'll link. In the, um, in the description of the video where he has developed loads and loads of JavaScript for lots of different puzzle types and he was very kind in helping me to input this puzzle into his 
JavaScript so that I can now demonstrate it uh, for you guys. So thank you very much, Otto. Really much appreciated. Now, let's take a look at how we might start this. What are the simple ways to start a Matthew puzzle? Well, the obvious places to start are the edges um, because let's have a look at that now. So let's look at um, well, let's look at this square, for example, this black square near the edge here. So we know that there must be a right angle for a loop and it's going to have to hit this. And we also know that when there's a black square, the loop has to extend for at least one square after the black square. So if I try and do this, you can see that the loop would now have to turn because it's hitting the edge of the grid and it hasn't even gone one black square. So this is impossible. So in fact, when there's a black square in this sort of position, that is forced, and that is forced. And again here, the loop is hitting this black square, and it needs to now turn and make a right angle. Can it go that way? No, because it can't extend far enough, so it must always extend that way. So this would be a simple way to start this puzzle. Other things to look for are two black squares in adjacent, or two black circles in adjacent squares like this, because we know that is impossible. Because if this was what you wanted to do, there would then have to be right angles, for example, like this. But you can see here we've broken the rule that says that the loop must extend for at least one whole black square after the circle. Here it's not; it's extended half a square. So, in fact, when you see two black squares together, you can always do that, which is a nice thing to know. Now, let's have a look at white squares on the edge. That's another nice thing to spot. Obviously, we know that the loop must extend through the white square in a straight line, but it can't go this way because it's just going to hit the edge of the grid. So, whenever there's a white square on the edge, we can always do that. Now, whenever there's two white squares on the edge like this, we can actually go further. We know the loop must extend through like this, but we know that in at least one of the squares adjacent to the white circle, the loop must turn. Now, let's look at this and study it in a bit more detail. Now, this white circle here, if we go downwards, the loop has not turned in this square this square here. Therefore it must turn here and it clearly can't turn left. So that is forced and by the same logic looking at this white circle that is also forced. So whenever you see two white circles on an edge that's uh, that's an easy win. Now what about when we have um, a black circle and a white circle next to it on an edge? Well again this is a nice easy win. We know that the the black circle has to extend out. We'll look at this white circle later. But now obviously the black circle can either go this way or this way. Now because of this white circle and we know that the loop must extend through the white circle, in fact it must be this way that we're forced to go. Now here we could connect these up because this white circle its rule has been sort of uh, it's been correctly followed because in this square the loop has turned so we could join those up we don't know they join up or not but it's not it's not um, ruled out to say that the loop could not connect here now the final thing I think before we actually go about solving this in earnest that I want to mention is sequences of white squares in the center of the grid. So let's take a look at, um, in fact, these three are probably the simplest example, or maybe these three. We'll do these three. Now, because we know that when, a, when the loop enters a white circle, it must extend through it, let's look what happens if on this first white circle here, we think that the loop goes horizontally. Well, it's going to hit this next white circle it's going to have to continue it's going to hit the next white circle it's going to have to continue and we would get this pattern well the problem here is that for this central white circle we have broken the puzzle this this 
the, the loop is not turning in either of the squares to the left or the right of this white circle. So this is a no-no, we cannot do this. Now that is important because it means whenever we have three white circles together, we can always do this. Uh, I've extended this one down because it hit this one. So this is, is very powerful. And in this puzzle in particular, you can see it's, it's, it really gives us, you, us a way of getting into the center of the puzzle. So let's look around and see what we can do. Um, we can do exactly the same into these eight circles. They almost all do like go like that. And we know that because let's study this circle, the loop has not turned as it on the right hand side of it. It must turn on the left hand side. It must turn here. Now we don't know whether it goes up or down, but we know it can't extend into this black circle. Now if that's the case and we know the black circle has a, a right angle through it, we know that. Let me, let me explain why again. If we know that the black circle cannot go this way and we know it has a right angle, just think about the two ways you can make a right angle if you can't go right off this black square. The only ways would be either that way or I guess this way, oops, like that. So in either of those situations, there is this line. So we must definitely make use of that, that fact. So now I'm actually gonna try and go a bit faster and um, see if I can actually solve it. So again here, you can see this cannot extend further downwards. Now given that, we can actually write that in as well. Um, and we know the loop is going to turn in either of those two positions and therefore we can also do that there let's do that and this and this and this and here's a classic piece of Nickley logic um, now so far we've not really thought terribly hard about the loop property now we know we need all these disparate lines that we've created to to make a single loop in the grid. So let's look at this pattern down here. Now hopefully it's clear to everybody that if we look at this white circle, we can't do that. If we do that, we have a massive problem because we're gonna, we've, we've sort of cut off our loop. We're gonna force that, or if not that, we're gonna force this. Either of those things is gonna create two loops in the puzzle. So that's very important. That allows us to make or draw that line in. Let's carry on like this. So you can see that's all forced. And this is the sort of thing that you have to start thinking about. This line, or this, this end of this line, can it turn right here? If it turns right like that, we're going to get the same problem. We're going to cut our loop off and force a single loop far too early. So we know, in fact, that extends up like that. And therefore, because this square here oops, needs to turn like this, we actually get to do that. Now, whenever a white square is uh, adjacent to a square that contains a right angle like this, we know this can't go downwards. That's impossible. So we know this one must go across and we still haven't met the condition for this white square. It must turn in this square. Can it turn up? No. That would break the rule for the black square. The black square we know that the right angles have to extend for a complete square. This has not done that. So again here oops, we know this is going to turn this way and we know that that must be the case. Now can this black square go this way? No, because then this square would not have a, a right angle in it. So again, we get to make some fairly simple deductions like that. This is the same pattern that we had over here. So we can make that. Do this here. Again, this can't connect here, so it must turn. Some of you may be thinking, 
wow, this seems very complicated. It's, it's actually not. The, these Nickley puzzles is just a case of learning the rules. And once those rules become familiar to you, uh, actually applying them in some fairly straightforward ways is not too difficult. Now I've drawn this line vertically here because if I if I go downwards in this direction I hit this line. I, I, I'm going to create uh, well it can't be a single loop if I go down like that. So the fact that I know this can't go downwards means it must be upwards. Here again we can do the same thing. This can't cut this loop here. Um, so what would I be looking for next? Well, let's extend this line up. We can do the same thing because we have a line of three circles. That allows us to do that. This white square must turn because it's not turned to the left hand side. So it turns to the right hand side like this. This must turn. Ah, this is nice, isn't it? Look, this white square circle here, we can't extend through here because that's going to give us an enormous long straight line that breaks this white circle's rule. So we know, in fact, that must do that. And given this can't do that, it must do this. And this is turning, this is turning, so that must go that way like that. And this black square can't come this way because it's going to hit the loop. So this must go that way. And look, we're getting up to another situation here where this loop is getting dangerously close to sort of completing itself and forcing there to be two loops in the grid. So that's going to have to go downwards. This goes left because it can't go right. Um, now what next you may add? Well let's look at this. Can this can this turn upwards? If this turns upwards, whoops, we're going to have a loop problem again. So these both must be horizontal, which means that's forced, that's forced, that's forced. This must come down because we it can't complete its own loop. And I can't quite see how to resolve that. We know this turns here, so that must go downwards like that. Otherwise, this white circle is going to break. And what's the next easy step? Ah, this can't go down. If this black square goes down, this white circle breaks. So let's move that up that sort of chops off this edge of the loop. So now this turns and must extend because it goes through a white square. That allows us to do this, which allows us to do that. And we're starting to make a little bit more progress with the loop up here. Um, now, this must turn so it must come down, this must turn so it must go up which actually allows us to do that. Now this black square we have to be careful about cutting the loop off as well. If it goes upwards look it now can't get out. So this edge can't get out from it's sort of locked in its own corner. So in, we must avoid that. That must go down. This must go this way because it can't cut the loop. That forces that to connect here. This now can't go upwards, so it must go downwards. This white square can't go horizontally because it can't extend. Oops. Uh, so this must go downwards as well. And we know that this, because this, neither of these white squares has met its condition yet, the loop must turn here. Well, it can't turn left, so it must turn right. And look, we get very dangerously close to creating a loop again. So that must now do this. This needs to turn. Oops, I didn't mean to go quite that far. So it must do that. Hmm. And again, this is looking very... If we start closing the loop here, we might run into a problem very quickly. 
Mark. Let me just have a quick check of that. G well, maybe not. But this comes this way because it must do. Ah, there we go. Um, and now it must extend this way. It can't turn up or it's it's locked in a cul-de-sac. We know that there can't be cul-de-sacs. Now if this now goes this way, we've got a problem because that will turn and that will create a single loop again. So we know that's not going to happen. That must, oh dear, it's getting a bit lost there. I think that's, that's right, that looks correct again. Um, so we know this is going to, uh, it's either going to join to this side or this side of this long chain of um, sort of four long lines here. And we're going to have to do that in a way that doesn't cut anything off. I'm just going to check whether I can see any other simple way of finding this further. Yeah, this is nice, isn't it? Classic Nickley. It requires us to just do a little bit of checking here to see whether we're going to run into a problem. And look what happens if I join this up. If I join this up, this is forced, this is forced, this is forced, and that's forced. And we create our own loop again, which we know cannot be right. So we know now this must turn away from here, and it must join that way. And look, this is now becoming a little bit more straightforward. And again, we've got to be careful. If I join this to this, I've I've created a loop. I mustn't do that. And this is lovely as well, isn't it? Now look, if I if I extend through vertically through this white square, you may think, oh, that's okay. Well, no, it's not, because then this edge of the loop can't connect to anything. So again, that must do this. Careful not to close the loop. So that's forced, that's forced. This is forced, this is forced, this is forced, that's forced. And look, we just have to be careful here again. That's now got to go upwards because I don't want to close off the loop. This white square needs to fulfill its condition so it must go downwards. That forces the loop to come this way. And let's just think about how this is going to work now. Can we? can't see quickly how to resolve that so I think we're going to have to have a look up here Further. just checking I can't see an obvious error here it would be bad Doosh. Let's have a look at these white circles and ask ourselves whether that is ever possible. And look at the beautiful way that Nicolay set this up. This, this is just not going to work, is it? Because now, what would we do with the loop? We've still got a white circle we need to go through, so we know one side of this needs to go upwards. But how is this ever going to escape now without hitting this? And once it hits this, it's going to close its loop. So, in fact, we know this doesn't go vertical. It must go this way. And that means this does go vertical. And now, for the reasons we've just talked about, it can never extend in this direction because then it will get trapped. So, oh no, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> there we go. So, we know this. neither of these branches can go vertically. They, well, they're not upwards, they must go downwards like this and again we know if we extend this one downwards we're going to create a loop so that must also be forced and look at the way this is going to unwind now, this is just gorgeous this can't connect to this loop so that is what fixes this like that mustn't close the loop and there we go and hopefully if I've not made a mistake um, that is how you do 
a Masu puzzle and quite a difficult Masu puzzle, the ones you get in the US Puzzle Championship, they're not meant to be guineas. Um, but I hope for those of you who are new to Masu, that was a good sort of primer as to how to get into them. If you go to um, Otto's website, he's got about 100 examples of Masu that you can try for yourselves. Um, and now that the nickley.com website is defunct, this is uh, it's as good a place as any to practice them and enjoy enjoy the logic that you can find there. So I'm going to probably come back to some of these Japanese pencil puzzles over the coming weeks um, just for a break from Sudoku from time to time or crosswords. If you enjoy them please let us know. If you'd like me to assume more knowledge of what you know already and just you know hammer into the, the puzzle rather than explaining the rules, happy to do that but uh, it's hard for me to gauge where everyone is uh, in the first instance. If you enjoy the content, please subscribe. You know we appreciate it. And we'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.